darkness you see there's life for a look at the savior and life more abundant and free oh turn your eyes upon jesus look full in his wonderful face and the thing In the light of His glory and grace Through death into life everlasting He passed and He followed Him there O'er us and no more have dominion For more than the conquerors we are Turn your eyes upon Jesus, look full in his wonderful face, and the things of earth will grow strangely dim in the light of his glory and grace. In the light of His glory and grace, oh, turn your eyes upon Jesus, look full in His wonderful face, and the things of the earth will grow strangely dim in the light of His glory and grace.
Good morning, everyone, and thank you, Mr. Lafayette Harris, our music director, for that inspiring prelude. We're here to worship Jesus, and we do ask that he would lead us and guide us along the way. I'm Reverend Clark Bradley, pastor of Fourth Presbyterian Church in the Bronx. We thank you for joining us for our worship service. This is our streaming worship service for July 12, 2020. Welcome to our members and our friends. Thank you for joining us to worship Jesus Christ on this Sunday morning. And a special welcome to our first-time visitors, any first-time visitors who may be watching this stream. We thank you for joining. And to start our worship service, I'd like to bring up our call, excuse me, not our call to worship, our order of worship, so that our, if we have any first-time visitors with us, you can see the service for today. This is what our service looks like. This is a listing of the, of the things we'll be doing. You see the highlighted line up top for greeting. That's where we are right now. We're going to move to the call to worship in just a moment. But first, I'd like to thank Lafayette Harris, our music director, and Elder Gloria Vidal, the worship assistant, for helping on today's service. So let's move now to our call to worship. It comes from the book of Revelation. This is one of the heavenly visions of in, found in the book of Revelation. It's a description of the worship of Jesus. This is the Jesus as the Lamb. So when it says, worthy is the Lamb, it's talking about Jesus. This is the worship of Jesus in heaven. So our call to worship today, Revelation chapter 5, verses 11 to 13. I heard the voice of many angels, numbering thousands upon thousands and 10,000 times 10,000. In a loud voice they sang, Worthy is the Lamb who was slain to receive power and wealth and wisdom and strength and honor and glory and praise. Then I heard every creature in heaven and on earth and under the earth and on the sea and all that is in them singing. To him who sits on the throne and to the Lamb, be praise and honor and glory and power forever and ever. Amen. Amen. Let us worship God and let's pray. Heavenly Father, we do praise you that, that you sent, you would send your Son to save us, to become the Lamb who takes away the sin of the world. Thank you, Lord Jesus, for, for the the incredible grace that you showed to us, the mercy of your Father that you brought to us when you came to earth. Thank you for becoming our Savior on the cross. And we do pray that by your Holy Spirit, that we would honor you in our praise and worship this day. Amen. 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 We're going to continue our worship service now. Elder Gloria Vidal will lead us in our prayer of confession. Let us pray. Almighty God, to you our hearts are an open book. You know our desires. We hide no secret sin from you. Lord, have mercy on us. Wash all our thoughts and desires clean in the pure love of your Holy Spirit so that we may more perfectly love you and more properly worship your holy name. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Amen.
Friends, I'd ask you to join me in the assurance of pardon. Today, our assurance of pardon is printed on the screen. It comes from 1 John, John's first letter, chapter 1, verse 9. So I'd ask you to join me in reading this together. The assurance of pardon. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just and will forgive us our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. Friends, believe this good news. In Jesus Christ, we are forgiven and that all God's people say, Amen. 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 And we come now to the uh, passing of the peace. Let me stop sharing. So we can again wave to each other here. And so we can, peace of the Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. And those of you who are with family or friends, you can pass the peace of the Lord Jesus among yourselves. And uh, those who are on the Facebook live stream can, in the chat, can pass the peace in the chat window. So uh, peace be with you all. And I want to move on now to the next part of our of our order of worship for today it is the children's blessing so at this time if there are any children whatever whatever people are watching who have children with them i'd ask you to bring the children forward towards the screen to receive Jesus' Jesus's blessing. So bring the children forward. If you could ask them to stretch out their hand so that uh, to receive the blessing of our Lord Jesus. Heavenly Father, I do call on you now to bless the children who are hearing this, who are hearing or viewing this live stream. Lord, you know each of them by name. I lift them up to you and pray that you would surround them with your mighty angels, that you would guard and protect them from harm and evil in the week ahead. Lord, I do pray that you would bless these children this summer, that you would keep them safe, that you would keep them healthy through the summer, protect them from the coronavirus, and I ask, Lord, that you would use this summertime as an opportunity to open their, their hearts to know you better, open their minds to learn your word. I do pray, Heavenly Father, for these blessings upon our children. Amen. Amen. And we'll continue our worship service now. We'll move on. But we're coming to announcements, but I just wanted to bring the order of worship up again, especially if we... Hopefully we do have some first-time visitors with us, and you might not be so familiar with our service. So you see towards the middle now, announcements is highlighted. We're coming to the announcements. Let's actually move on to that right now. So these are our announcements for today. Uh, you can see the Children's Sunday School is over now. It will be meeting for the rest of this month, the last Sunday of Children's Online Sunday School for this season will be July 26th. We'll see what will happen in the fall. We're, we're not sure about that yet. So we've still got a few weeks of Children's Online Sunday School. And I hope if you have kids that you can contact Demetrius. Or if you want to, you can contact the church you see in several places our email, fourthpcbronx at gmail.com. So our live worship service is today at 11, so you obviously must know about that since you're watching. Then there is a, an announcement here about receiving, that the church can receive electronic donations through the Zelle app, and the address for that, treasurer at fourthpc.org. When we get towards the end of the service, for the at the time of the offering we'll bring that information up and it'll be clearer on the screen so the that giving information will come back to it during the offering if you were our next the next item on our order of worship is the prayers of the people and if you want to if you want us to pray for you if you have a prayer request please send it email it to us at fourthpcbronx at gmail.com and put the word prayer in the subject line. So make the subject line the word prayer so that we 
can identify the prayers and we'll add them to our prayer list. There's a couple other announcements under the Today section that have information about testing for COVID-19 antibodies for the coronavirus. So you can look at those later. And by the way, I usually mention this early on, I forgot to today, all of the images that you're seeing, or actually not quite all of them that you're seeing, but all the images that have text on them that we're reading, the prayers, the scripture readings, the, all the songs, the lyrics to the songs, all of those images will be on the church's Facebook page. <coughs> Excuse me. Those images will all be on the church's Facebook page. But they'll be on a different, <coughs> excuse me, they'll be on a different post than the live stream itself. I send those separately from the live stream. So just look for that post and the images are there and you can see all of this information there, uh, including the information about the coronavirus testing. So now upcoming events. Uh, this Thursday, we're having a Zoom meeting, a session meeting via Zoom, I should say, a session meeting via Zoom at 6 p.m. And one of the issues that we're going to be discussing, well, the main issue that we'll be discussing is what are we going to do about returning to live worship here in the church? And the one of the, one of the things we're going to talk about regarding live worship is the survey that we've sent out. So you should have received it by email, and some of the people who aren't online received it by paper. Uh, we mailed it to them, and they've mailed back responses. So far, we've got 22 responses, which is really pretty good. Uh, uh, five mailbacks and 17 emails. So if you want your response to the survey to be included, you're going to need to mail it by Monday, and you're going to need to email it by uh, Tuesday it needs to get into Monday's mail. We should receive it by Wednesday. And then you need to, if you're going to email it, you need to email it by Tuesday night so that Wednesday we can tabulate the results for our session meeting. We can start tabulating the results for the session meeting. So if you haven't finished, if you haven't completed the survey, please do so. If you need to get a copy, an electronic copy of it, just send a request to that church email, fourthpcbronx at gmail.com, and we'll send one out to you, and you can complete the form electronically. And the final, uh, the next upcoming event is next Sunday. Whatever we decide about returning to worship, we're not going. We're going to be streaming live next Sunday. So next Sunday, we hope to see you, and. One of the, I just wanted to mention, one of the issues that we have to deal with regarding coming back to worship in the summertime is the heat. Perhaps those of you who are visually astute have noticed I am not in the sanctuary anymore. And uh, what I did was I took my spot in, I took Gloria's spot in my office, and Gloria is now out in the main office. So we have switched around a little bit here. And we, um, um, one of the issues is it's, it's really hot. It's actually, it's not, it's so hot today, but it's really humid down in that sanctuary. I would just be sweating all over the place if I was down there. So we could not worship in the main sanctuary or in the side room where we normally worship in the summer without turning on either fans or air conditioners. And if there was one person sick in the whole group, with the virus, that virus would be spread all over the place by the fans. So that's one of the problems we have regarding related to returning to live worship here at the church this during the summer months. So that's just one of the issues that we'll be discussing at our session meeting on Thursday. So the last issue to note is, I've mentioned it already, on July 26th, that will be the final online Sunday school for this summer. So those are the announcements for today. Let me stop sharing and see if Gloria or Lafayette have any additional announcements. I do not. No. I think, okay. So let's continue our, we'll continue with our
prayers of the people, that's what comes up next, the prayers of the people. So let's be together in prayer now. Heavenly Father, we come to you today thankful for your many gifts. Lord, even at a time that, that seems so turbulent as this, with the pandemic, with social unrest, with, with it just this global pandemic, not just in the city and not just, in, not just in America, Lord, we come to you thankful because you have blessed us so wonderfully. Thank you for the gift of life on this day in the world that you created for us. Thank you for making this world for us. Thank you for sending your Son to be for us a Redeemer and a Savior, to save us from our sins, to redeem that sin, and draw us by your Spirit into your eternal presence. Thank you for the promise of, of eternal eternity with you in heaven. We do praise you and thank you, Heavenly Father, for all your gifts. We lift up to you now our, our pray prayers for those we know and, and for the world around us. Lord, we do pray for the sick and the shut-in of this congregation. We lift up to you especially James and Olive and Trevor. We pray for Acusia and Acusia. We lift up to you Elizabeth, Elaine, and Melanie, and we also pray for Pat in Chicago. Lord, we do pray for them. We ask, Lord, for you to give strength of body and healing to those who are sick. We pray for you to, to speed the recovery of those who are getting over illnesses or surgery. We ask, Lord, for your blessing on all of our people, and we lift up to you, Lord, the session meeting coming this Thursday, and ask that you would guide us in, in making the difficult decisions that we have to make in the future, for the, for the future of this church. Lord, we also pray for our city and state and nation. We lift up to you our mayor and city council. We pray for our governor, our state senate, our state assembly. We lift up to you our president and vice president, our, our Congress in Washington and Senate in Washington, our Supreme Court. And we do pray, Lord, for all of these political leaders that you would bless them with the desire to, to bring peace to trouble to bring order out of the chaos that seems to be ruling so much in, in this, not only in this nation, but around the world. We do pray, Lord, for peacemakers. We ask, Lord, that you would bless this nation with peacemakers. You have brought us so far in this nation. We pray now, Lord, that you would bless us with peacemakers, that you would inspire them, that you would guide them with wisdom and discernment. We ask, Lord, that you would protect their persons and protect their work from the forces that continue to seek to divide us, to separate us, to bring violence to our nation. Lord, we do pray that you would, that you would bless us with this gift of peacemakers. Lord, we lift up to you First responders, we pray, Lord, for all who, who are risking their health and their lives to protect and to serve the, the, our city and our nation. Lord, we pray especially for those in health care who are, who are watching over the sick. We ask, Lord, for you to, to open the minds of, of medical researchers seeking cures and therapies and vaccines for the coronavirus so that they can quickly accomplish this task. Lord, we do pray for the caregivers of our congregation. Lord, we have people in our congregation who, who spend so much time caring for others, and we ask, Lord, that you would bless them in this, this duty that they have taken on, this work that they have taken on, and we ask that you would give them the physical strength and the, the spiritual perseverance, the spirit of perseverance to, 
complete that task that they have that they have taken on that has come upon them because of their situation in this life. So Lord, we lift these things up to you and we pray also for your church around the world. We pray especially for your persecuted church. We ask for you to bless your people around the world with, with mighty faith that is stronger than the persecution that comes against them. We pray for your church, especially in Africa, in the Middle East, in South Asia and East Asia, and ask that you would release mighty power through your, the believers in your son, Jesus Christ, in these regions, that you would multiply faith, that you would that you would encourage believers, that you would give them boldness. And we ask, Lord, that you would protect them, protect their faith, protect their, their bodies and their sanctuaries, and release your power through them to multiply your kingdom in this time. We ask these things in the name of our Savior, your Son, the Lord Jesus Christ, and we close this prayer saying the prayer that he taught us to pray together. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil, for thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. 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 We'll continue our worship service now. We'll continue our service with our, our first hymn for today, Rejoice, O Pure in Heart. We'll bring the words up as the music comes up. We'll bring the words onto the screen so that you can sing along with our choir, which will lead us in our first hymn, Rejoice, O Pure in Heart. for leading us in our hymn. We come now to our scripture readings. Let me bring our scripture readings up here. We'll start with a reading from Colossians, a few verses from Colossians. But before we read, let's pray. 
Heavenly Father, the gift of your word is so precious. Lord, give our hearts a hunger for your word. Teach our minds the, the true precious value of the words that you, the creator of all things, have spoken to us. Thank you, Heavenly Father, for the gift of the word. And we ask that through your spirit, you would bless us, anoint us with understanding and knowledge as we read these words that you have given us. Amen. Amen. Our New Testament reading is from Colossians chapter 1, verses 21 to 23a. We're going to have, similar to last week, we're going to have a series of readings. We'll have several readings after this from Matthew's Gospel. And uh, this, there's, a, there's a theme that's being followed. It's not nearly as prominent in the Bible as the theme that we followed last week, but it's quite, uh, it's quite prolific in the New Testament. So we're going to follow this theme through the Bible. We're going to start with Colossians chapter 1, verses 21 to 23. This is a letter written by the Apostle Paul. He wrote, he wrote to the believers in the city of Colossae, Once you were alienated from God and were enemies in your minds because of your evil behavior. But now... He has reconciled you by Christ's physical body through death to present you wholly in his sight, without blemish and free from accusation. If you continue in your faith, established and firm, not moved from the hope held out in this gospel. Now for our readings from the Gospel of Matthew, let me enlarge it just a little bit here, see a little bit more. We've got three sections here, all from Matthew's Gospel. First from chapter 5, and then chapter 6, a few, a few verses there. Remember, Jesus' most famous sermon, the Sermon on the Mount, is Matthew chapters 5, 6, and 7. So this sermon is the center of Christian teaching, New Testament teaching about the Christian life, and that's part of what we're going to be considering today. So let's read first from Matthew chapter 5, verse 6. This is one of the Beatitudes. Then we'll jump to verse 16 and then to Matthew chapter 6. So the Beatitude in Matthew chapter 5, verse 6. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness for they will be filled. And then in verse 16, in the same way, let your light shine before men that they may see your good deeds and praise your Father in heaven. And now to Matthew chapter 6. Be careful not to do your acts of righteousness before men to be seen by them. If you do, you will have no reward from your Father in heaven. So when you give to the needy, do not announce it with trumpets as the hypocrites do in the synagogues and on the streets to be honored by men. I tell you the truth. They have received their reward in full. But when you give to the needy, do not let your left hand know what your right hand is doing so that your giving may be in secret. Then your Father, who sees what is done in secret, will reward you. And now for our final verse, Matthew chapter 25, verse 21. I do pray that you're blessed as you hear this verse. This is a great verse. It actually occurs twice in this parable. This is part of a parable. This one verse from the, the parable, uh, it's called the parable of the talents. The, this is a parable about the kingdom of God, and so the master of the kingdom of God is, of course, God himself. So this is God's word to his faithful people. Be blessed as you hear God's words. Let these words be true to you for you as well. His master replied, 
Well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful with a few things. I will put you in charge of many things. Come and share your master's joy, your master's happiness. And friends, this is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. And now for our anthem, we'll continue our worship service with our anthem. Our choir is going to lead us, uh, receive this blessing of music, My God is Awesome. Our anthem, My God is Awesome, by our choir. from the rain. 
Please pray with me now. Heavenly Father, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, our Lord and our Redeemer. Amen. Why do people do things? Do you understand why people do things in the world around you? Do you understand human nature? human motivations, or maybe you constantly wonder, why are people acting that way? On the other hand, perhaps, for, your, for the most part, you do understand why people do the things they do. If you wish to learn about human nature, I suggest you launch your study with the Bible. Start with the stories, especially those Old Testament stories. Human nature hasn't changed in 4,000 years, so you're not missing anything. Read books like Genesis or Judges, 1st and 2nd Samuel. Think about the stories. You'll realize that people, you'll realize that people behave the same now as they did back then, in ancient times. Then graduate from stories to the Bible's wisdom literature, especially Psalms, Proverbs, Ecclesiastes. Learn the stories plus that wisdom literature, those wisdom teachings, and you have built yourself a solid foundation for understanding human nature. Now, today we've got really cool technology. No doubt about it, we got better technology. That's changed, but human nature, it's the same as always. We do the same things for the same reasons. Today, we're going to study one element of human nature, an element that Jesus plucks out to critique in our text from Matthew chapter 6. We'll discover that that ancient element of human nature Jesus plucks out as a very modern equivalent. And then we're going to move on to consider why people, including people like us, why do people behave this way, and, and how can we avoid the pitfalls of this behavior through spiritual growth? First, turn to our two verses from Matthew chapter 5. Jesus opens his most famous sermon, the Sermon on the Mount, with a short passage called the Beatitudes. Beatitude means blessing. For example, our text in Verse 6, blessed are you, are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be filled. Jesus blesses hunger and thirst for God's justice to be done, to be accomplished in this world. A little later in verse 16, Jesus instructs us on how to shift the world toward God's righteousness. Let your light shine before men, Jesus said. Let your light shine before men that they may see your good deeds and praise your Father in heaven. Well, in other words, when people see your good example of righteous, just behavior, when they see that kind of behavior going on around them, and friends, listen, especially when children see this behavior, good and righteous behavior in their parents, when people see others living out righteousness, living godly lives, well, they quite frequently will start to live that way themselves. It is possible 
for human societies to improve in this world. And the main way that happens is when God's righteousness shines like a beacon through his people, people inhabited by God's Holy Spirit. God has chosen to provide spiritual illumination in the world, to the world, through his people. If they hide their righteousness so that no one sees it, well, that dims, the powerful effect of their righteous behavior is dimmed. Instead, Jesus says, let people see your good deeds and praise your Father in heaven. Whenever your good deeds do glorify God, well, you have just made the world a little better, a little bit better, a little more uh, righteous. Now, this leads us up to this, this background about making the world more righteous, leads us to our text, in our, it's our key text, Matthew chapter 6, verse 1 and, and verse 2. Be careful not to do your acts of righteousness, righteousness before men to be seen by them. Jesus warned, if you do, you have no reward from your Father in heaven. Well, what's up, Jesus? Should we do good deeds in public so people can see them or not? Do our acts of righteousness, do they bring honor to God or not? Well, Jesus, didn't you just say a minute ago that you would bless the hunger to do righteousness. Uh, friends, Jesus occasionally uses this technique of emphatically stating one position, then turning around, and a few minutes later saying what, what appears to be the opposite. This tactic causes people who listen thoughtfully, causes them to sit up and think, sit up and wonder, what, what, what does he mean? The juxtaposition of two opposing ideas forces people to think more deeply about the topic. And that is precisely why Jesus uses the tactic. So let's think more deeply about the topic as Jesus wanted us to do. In Matthew chapter 6, Jesus clearly specifies the motivation behind what we could call false righteousness. In Matthew chapter 6, Jesus starts off describing false righteousness, what righteousness is not. Now, did you catch the motive? Be careful not to do your acts of righteousness before men, Jesus said, and then he pinpoints the problem to be seen by them. What motivates false righteousness? The desire to be seen by your peers, by people around you, to be seen, <coughs> excuse me, to be seen as a good and decent person, even more, to be <coughs> applauded and honored by your community. Jesus adds in verse 2, he warns against giving charity or alms to be honored by people. Here's the distinction Jesus makes. False righteousness, who gets the praise and honor from your good deed? You do. When Jesus describes truly righteous behavior, well, people still do see your good deed, but it's your Father in heaven who receives the praise and honor, not you. But why would people praise God for your good deed? The reason must be because you told them to. You, the person who did the good deed, you pointed to God as the source and motivation of your righteousness. You didn't allow people 
to exalt you. You wouldn't let people do that. As soon as they tried, you redirected their attention. You used the opportunity to give honor to the name of Jesus because your motivation actually was to be seen by your Father in heaven, not by people on earth. In either case, the external good deed looks the same, giving alms or charity to the poor in Jesus' example from Matthew chapter 6. It isn't the amount given that makes the difference, but the internal spiritual motivation, the spiritual condition motivating your act. <coughs> Excuse me. Motivation makes all the difference. So friends, I must ask, who is your audience? Did you notice Jesus didn't say, if you do something good? He said, when? You should be doing good. You should have acts of righteousness in the la that you've done in the last week. But who was your audience? Was your audience people around you? Was, your, was it people seeing your good deeds? Or was your audience to be seen by your Father in heaven and not by people on earth? In either case, it will look the same. But who are you trying to, to impress? People or God? Trying to please people is an element of human nature. And this is one of those parts of human nature that hasn't changed in thousands of years. It's still prevalent today. In fact, it seems to be at an all-time high today, arguably worse than any other time in history. But we've renamed this element of, spirit, of human nature. Instead of people-pleasing, that, that's an older term, and it's a term that actually is found in the Bible, Instead of people-pleasing, the modern version is called virtue signaling. And today's social media empowers this human proclivity, this human tendency like never before. In the age of global communications, literally the whole world can see your righteous deeds your good works, and the whole world can applaud you. Virtue signaling is a symptom of our desire to be seen by people as good and decent. People signal their virtue, their goodness, with messages broadcasting their good intentions on social media platforms from Twitter to Facebook to Instagram and, and beyond, hoping to receive notices of approval from the world. Those notices take the form of likes. The like, the share buttons, possess amazing psychological power. If Jesus were preaching today, he'd say, every time someone smashes the like button, you just received your reward for virtue signaling. There is no reward from your heavenly father. You just got it. Human nature hasn't changed, but wow, our, our technology sure has. Approval in the form of likes, it can make people do crazy things, just like the desire to be seen in ancient times. Because we so desperately crave approval. We long to be seen as, as a good and decent person. When Jesus said they have received their reward in full, he meant, he meant it in terms of social reward. They've received their reward in full, their social reward, the approval by significant people in their life, in their community. It's the same psychological reward people hope to receive by virtue signaling on modern-day social media. 
This hasn't changed. Jesus warns believers, this is not righteousness. This is not the way of God's righteousness. The, divide, the desire for likes today, same as the desire to be seen in Jesus' day. It is the desire to be seen as a good person according to the world stand the world standards of good this desire it will form your soul it will shape your thinking it will shape your will in ways that lead away from god this desire makes you a slave to other people's vision of the good this is not God's vision of the good. It enslaves you to other people's vision of the good. And it's that precise attitude Jesus attacks in the opening verses of Matthew chapter 6. You can never become righteous by striving to be seen as righteous. The very attitude is so self-centered. I want people to see me as righteous. Do not hunger and thirst for other people's approval, Jesus advises. Instead, seek approval from your heavenly Father who sees what you do in secret. Note that, well, excuse me, not, not that being a good and virtuous person is bad for your soul. Quite the contrary. If you truly hunger and thirst for God's justice and righteousness, Jesus promises a divine blessing for people like you. But you cannot serve two masters. As Jesus would later say in Matthew chapter 6, you cannot serve both justice and Twitter. You cannot serve God's righteous will and popular opinion. In fact, intense devotion to serving the good and perfect will of God, it has one result. It always ends the same way. You will be crucified. I hope not literally like Jesus was. But people, they will seek to destroy you. In modern terms, they will try to cancel you. That also is human nature and has not changed. Now, we must dig deeper. We've got deeper still to go, deeper down to the roots of human nature, asking the question, why is it that people do hunger and thirst for approval? Why do, why do likes have so much control over us? Why does seeking applause and honor from people so powerfully drive our behavior? Friends, when, when we get down to the very basics of human nature, the Bible gives a short, easy answer. Why? Because God made us that way. God built into human nature the desire for approval. In this case, God made us with an intense longing to receive approval from the most significant being in the universe, himself. Our single verse from Matthew chapter 25 demonstrates the approval that we were built to desire. We're built not only to desire, we're built to receive it. That verse is part of a parable about the kingdom of heaven. It speaks of a master. Well, the master of the kingdom of heaven is obviously God. And the servant in our verse receives the ultimate in approval. Hearing God say, well done, my good and faithful servant. Come and share your master's happiness, the joy of my eternal kingdom. Friends, 
We are made to seek approval. We need approval. Lack of approval, lack of acknowledgement from valued sources, from respected people, lack of their approval leads to feelings of unworthiness, inadequacy, shame. If we don't feel like a good and valued person, we will do whatever it takes, whatever it takes to get that approval. We will give people power over us if that gets us the approval we so desperately desire. So, if you hold power, the power of approval over other people, you could use it to twist them, twist them into knots. You can get people to do terribly immoral things. The very opposite of the good deeds that Jesus called us, called on us to do. You can get people to do this by demanding those evil deeds in order to get your approval. You know, teenagers are especially vulnerable to this form of spiritual abuse. Abuse. It was ages ago that pimps and cults learned how to use approval to capture teenage minds and souls. But, you might ask, if God, the, the master of the universe, if God built us to receive his approval, to hear, to hear his voice calling to us, well done, good and faithful servant, then why? Why would people sell their souls to get anyone else's approval? After all, there is no person more valued, respected, honored, and worshipped than God. Why isn't his approval enough for us? Our final text in Colossians chapter 1 helps us answer the question, why aren't we satisfied with God's approval? But I warn you, the answer is difficult to hear. The Apostle Paul wrote, he wrote these words, you were alienated from God. You were his enemies. You were enemies in your minds because of your evil deeds. In other words, we don't receive God's approval because we actually are not worthy of God's approval. We are sinners. We, we're, we're under God's wrath, not his approval. As sinners apart from Christ, we are alienated from God. We're his enemies, not his beloved children. God does not, he will not approve of our evil behavior. Human nature, it's easily corrupted because our sin alienates us from God and we do not receive the approval of God our souls need and our hearts desperately desire. So we seek out approval wherever we can find it from people around us whose opinions seem to matter. People who are themselves sinners who will abuse the power over us we give them by desiring their approval. And people, when we give them that power, they know what they have over us. Now, we can be made to do the most extreme, bizarre acts, the most evil deeds, all because we long and will do anything to satisfy our soul's hunger for approval. Instead of a hunger and thirst for righteousness, we find in our hearts a hunger and thirst for, a hunger and thirst for approval by people around us, a hunger and thirst for approval by this fallen world. 
and that illicit hunger to be seen by, by significant people and as good and decent. This is what Jesus attacks and critiques in the opening verses of Matthew chapter 6. So, this is the condition of human nature. We are separated from God. We feel incomplete without God's presence in our lives. We feel incomplete because we are incomplete without God's presence. As St. Augustine famously wrote over 16 centuries ago, Lord, my heart is restless until it finds its rest in you. Friends, in order to avoid the pitfalls of false righteousness, we must learn this spiritual truth that we cannot control our desire for approval because it's built into us. It's part of us. It's part of who we are. It's built into our nature. So learn this truth and then learn to grow. Learn that we can point the desire of our hearts back to its true north. By the work of the Holy Spirit, this desire can be reset upon its proper object, our Lord Jesus Christ. This is the spiritual growth that must occur so that we avoid the pitfalls of, of longing and desiring the approval of other people. We must teach our souls to long and desire the approval of God, which is the proper source, the proper object of this longing and desire. As Paul wrote in our text from Colossians, once you were alienated from God, you were enemies in your minds, a condition that, that leads to much of our evil behavior. But now, Paul adds, now God has reconciled you by Christ's physical death. Through death, through his physical body, through his death on the cross, he presents you wholly in God's sight, without blemish, free from accusation. Friends, do you hear that? By faith in Jesus, you are no longer an object of wrath in God's eyes. In his sight, you are holy, holy and free from blemish. In Christ, you are God's beloved child. He loves you, and through the work of his Spirit, through his Spirit, God longs to fill your heart with the knowledge of his deep, abiding approval. He will never leave you nor forsake you. The approval of God is yours now and forever. Hallelujah! So continue in faith, as the apostle wrote. Be established and firm not moved from this blessed hope in Christ, this divine hope found only in the gospel of Jesus. Turn to Jesus, worship him, praise Jesus, devote yourself to serving his kingdom. Let his spirit fill you with the blessings that Jesus describes in the Beatitudes, like the blessing of a hunger and thirst for God's righteousness, not for people's approval. Let that desire, that hunger and thirst drive you to please Jesus so that when people see your good deeds, which God will make sure they do, without a moment's hesitation, you declare the source and motivation of your good works, your desire to please God who loves you. He loves you without measure. 
so you can feel free to please him without measure. Ask for the desire to live a life pleasing and honoring to your heavenly Father, and you will hear those blessed words of approval, those divine and ultimate words, well done, my good and faithful servant. Welcome. Enter now the joy of my heavenly kingdom. Amen. And let us pray. Heavenly Father, oh, we do long for your approval. Lord, change our heart so that we desire to hear your words of approval. Lord, turn us away from the, the desire to please this world so that we can be firm and established in our devotion to your son, Jesus. We pray this in his holy and precious name. Amen. Amen. We come now to our affirmation of faith. Our affirmation of faith is from Philippians chapter 2, this wonderful passage that the Apostle Paul wrote. Uh, excuse me, I actually was supposed to bring this up first. The, before we go to our affirmation of faith, I just want to bring up one last time our order of worship. You see down at the bottom, Highlighted in yellow, Affirmation of Faith from Philippians chapter 2. That's where we are. So we're close to the end of our service now. And I'll bring up the Affirmation of Faith on the screen, this wonderful passage. It's called the Christ Hymn because it's about the glory of Jesus. And I'd ask Elder Gloria Vidal to lead us in our Affirmation of Faith. Let us say what we believe. Christ Jesus though he was in the form of God, did not regard equality with God as something to be exploited, but emptied himself, taking the form of a slave, being born in human likeness and being found in human form, he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Therefore, God also highly exalted him and gave him the name that is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus, everyone should kneel in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue should confess to the glory of God the Father. Jesus Christ is Lord. Amen. Amen. We come now to our next hymn. Our next hymn today is I'd Rather Have Jesus. So we'll bring the words up now, and I invite you to sing along with our choir, I'd Rather Have Jesus.
come now to our offering time. I want to bring our offering information up on the screen here. We'll leave this up on the screen for a minute or so here. You can give electronically. Fourth Church can now receive electronic donations through Zelle and PayPal apps. You can send them to treasurer at fourthpc.org. Of course, you can also give the traditional way. You can give by check. You can send your checks to the church, and you see the church's address there on the screen. So you can do that. And there's a third way. Surprisingly, in the last three or four weeks, I'll bet we have gotten half our donations by people bringing it to the church. You can, if you come to the new bold side of the church, enter the gate, and then come up to the doors, one of the doors has a mail slot on it. Just slide the slide your envelope through the mail slot, and we'll pick it up. Since there's really nobody in church uh, these days, we'll pick it up. So you can give that way, and I've actually been surprised. I think about half the people who've donated in the last two weeks have donated by coming to the church and depositing the you know their their check in the through the mail slot. And please do use checks. Don't send cash. It's difficult for Astrid to take cash to the bank right now. So please do send checks if you're going to be giving at this time. And I did want to, I meant when I was thinking of people here in the church, I, I forgot to mention, I don't know if I mentioned this last week, but we are, the church's administrative assistant, Kentaro Yoshida, restarted a week ago. So we brought him back. Uh, if you remember, geez, it's been about a month now since I mentioned that we got the PPP loan. That's that government program about coronavirus payroll protect, protection program. So we're bringing Kentaro back now, and he's, he's here three days a week, his, basically his same normal hours. So he will be, he has started, and he is here during the week. So if you slide the, the envelope through the slot, he'll probably be the one to pick it up and bring it upstairs. So please do feel free to bring the offering straight to the church. So now I'd like to move on. And Lafayette has really been blessing us with, with, wonderful, with wonderful offertories. Last week, I don't know if you can top last week, Lafayette. That was really good. So we'll see. So Lafayette now will lead us in worship through music. Okay. This is a rendition of Gloria. Oh, okay.
Lafayette. We come now to the, to the end of our service. Our final prayer is our prayer of dedication. Before I do bring it up on the screen, I would just pray that, that our Lord Jesus Christ has led you and guided you throughout this service, that you have received his spirit and experienced his joy. Let's now conclude with our closing prayer, which is also our prayer of dedication after the offering. I'd ask Elder Gloria Vidal to lead us in prayer. Gotta unmute. Let us pray. Oh, loving God, to turn away from you is to fall. To turn toward you is to rise. And to stand before you is to live forever. Grant us, dear God, in all our duties, your help. In all our uncertainties, your guidance. In all our dangers, your protection. And in all our sorrows, your peace. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. 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 We come to the end of our service. I'd ask that you receive God's benediction now. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God our Father, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you, with those you love, and with those nobody loves, this day and forevermore. Amen. Amen. Our service is over. Goodbye, and have a blessed week. We hope to see you on next, next week's live stream. So goodbye, everybody. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.